I think we'll get started. I, I'm delighted to see so many uh, friends, family, members of the Historical Society, and others, library staff. Uh, it's a great turnout, and we're just thrilled to see you all. Uh, my name is Gigi Barnhill, and I'm a past um, president of this organization. And I'm delighted today to introduce Cindy Jones, who is the ninth generation of her family uh, to be involved with the Coles home farm in North Amherst, and she's going to talk today about um, how they're meeting the needs of, I guess, the present generation. She'll talk about past generations. She's been working through uh, piles of archival records that are in the office um, in North, North Amherst. And since I have a long history as kind of an archivist curator, to see someone today in a business setting Sorting through old records just warms the cockles of my heart. And I think it's, it's great. This has clearly been such an important part of Amherst's history and the region's history that to preserve it and care about it is absolutely wonderful. I think you all know Cinda far better and for many more years than I, so I'm just going to turn it over Thank to you. Cinda. Thank her so much for coming. It is funny, uh, the house where my office is has been the um, home farm since 1768, and everybody left all their stuff. No. So, so you know, if you inherit your mom's house, maybe there's a pile of sweaters and some paperwork and some bills. We have bills from 1898 and, and some, some paperwork from the 1700s. And I tried to take pictures of some of it because I am trying to go through it. I bought archival albums, and we could look at it now without destroying it. But it's it's quite a task that my mom started a generation ago, and then um, she handed it back when she decided she wanted to move. So all this stuff just arrived in a big wheelbarrow, and I'm uh, trying to figure it out like she did. Um, hey. <laughs> So, do we want less light? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, this is the home farm, 134 Montague Road. And this is three carts of hay with two horses. I just thought it was cool. And I thought you'd all be talking and I'd have to wake you up. So, I didn't get to use it. Um, so, this is the home farm with our lumber supply a long time ago. Uh, Evan and I, Evan and I are the ninth generation of the family to live in this house. But the story starts before that. Uh, there's this guy named Egbert who wrote a three-volume genealogy, and it's at the Hatfield Historical Society. And he took um, from the start of Coles in America to 1900. And there is a paragraph about everybody. So the one, John Cole, came here. And then he had kids. And each of those kids had kids and this book. We had to go to every 40 pages to find three sentences about our line. So um, he studied the family, and he said we're not all that. Like, we worked hard, and we were good people, and we were respected, but we weren't great, and we weren't smart. <laughs> he stopped in 1900, and I really do think there are three big blips after 1900 that we would get credit for smart and... <laughs> and better than useful. But you, you can decide at the end if we make Egbert proud. So if we're not all that, okay, Egbert, how is it that we managed to eke out nine generations of a family business? Almost 275 years. And uh, it's pretty easy for the first 100 years because the oldest boy named Jonathan always got everything. <laughs> and all the other nine kids got nothing. And Jonathan never locked it up. So the whole farm got passed down to a whole bunch of Jonathans until about close to now. But after the Jonathans, from the late 1800s on, there's a David, and there are a couple Walters. And what we learned is to evolve the family farm, the home farm, for what our generation needed. We learned um, to get rid of outdated businesses, and we learned to regenerate, to use a forestry term of ours, to regenerate the home farm, to regenerate the family business. And to make it more relevant to the people running it and make it more inspiring for us to 
be as good, as great as we can be. So the values that have been passed down in the family are forestry values. We were taught to grow more than we cut, to sustainably manage our timberland, sure, but to, to buy more land than we'd ever sell or develop, to contribute to the community betterment, to give more than we took with the church, the town, uh, to leave behind something better than what we were lucky enough to be a Jonathan and inherit. <laughs> So um, the conquistadors came to South America to find gold and bring riches back to their part of Europe. And our ancestors came from England to get away from a Catholic king and to find religious freedom. And our first seal is of a naked Indian and a banner that says, please come help us. So we thought we were doing the world a favor by coming here and helping these poor backward savages with whatever life they were trying to live without us. So John Cole, C-O-L-E, came on this boat on 1634 and took a picture of it. And there's a, there's a second John Cole in Farmington, Connecticut. So he changed his spelling to one that nobody can pronounce correctly. So our name is Coles. Uh, in, so I'm going to, the first John, because there are like 18 Johns, Coles. So the first Cole, I'm just leaving his name that way, just so you know we're still talking about one. So he uh, was in Hartford, Connecticut after Farmington, and he came north to what's now South Hadley to Sunderland. It was the, the Hadley uh, settlement. And we uh, landed on the other side of the river, what's now Hatfield. So we were first settlers of Hatfield. Uh, with six families. That is Hannah Coles' actual signature. Mm -hmm. And because nobody else could read it either, they wrote it. <laughs> uh, so, Egbert says that treacherous Indians were uh, making us not want to come north. And he doesn't blame us for not coming north because our house was outside the stockade around Hatfield. I don't know what we did to the other eight families, <laughs> but we were outside the fence. So we uh, went back to Hartford for a couple years, and we tried women for witchcraft. Yeah. So Edward is not impressed yet. And uh, Edward said that uh, we were threatened that if we did not get our act together and buck up to the Indian threat, we would lose our land. So we moved from Hatfield and came to, uh, we moved from Harper and came to Hatfield. And we were rewarded by three years of massive Indian attacks. But at least our friends, the Kellogg's, um, weren't as lucky as we were, but they got kidnapped, taken to Canada. And um, they have Indian heritage now. <coughs> when they returned, they, they were with child. Uh, it was a dangerous time for everybody, let least of whom were the poor people whose country this was before we got here. Uh, so John Cole uh, was a founder of the town, so he helped build the church, and he was one of the selectmen, because there were eight people in town, and there was probably eight selectmen, <laughs> and eight church members. Uh, his son came with him from Hartford, and he married Deborah Bartlett. Uh, my mom and Sheila wrote this really cool, they devised and wrote a lot of this really cool book. And they have, a, they have some copies in the back of the room and Cindy Dickinson here is going to, Cindy here is going to help us hand these out. If you answer the trivia questions first, you get a book, okay? And this is about all the Amherst family farms, including ours. Um, so, John Cole named, uh, married Deborah Bartlett. How did Deborah Bartlett's father die in Northampton at this time? What? No, nope. shout it out. King of the head by Baby, how did he die? The Indians killed him. Yeah. Mr. Pell gets a book. Okay. The next Jonathan was born in Hatfield, and he had 28 sheep. And then he went to Central Amherst, and he was a selectman because there were probably 18 people in Amherst at that time. And there is a restaurant menu which credits his home. So 
where was this house? What house was it? And to whom did he sell this property? Did his ancestors sell this property according to a menu? Which is interesting. Person who yells it still gets a book. Okay, you might. Okay, so Jonathan Coles. Um, they say his house was the uh, Stockbridge House north of the homestead on the UMass campus. And records show that Cole sold quite a few acres to Mass Aggie to build the college. But uh, my mom's research shows that Jonathan first lived in the back L of the Black Walnut Inn. And that makes more sense for our settling North Amherst. But uh, there were a lot of Coles's and a lot of Jonathan Coles's, so it's up in the air. This is an uh, early map. This is um, Hatfield. I think I got this from the Hatfield Historical Society. Um, this is the settlement and the town common in Hadley and the allotment of the road to Amherst, the first allotment, the second, and the third. Wow. And so we were somewhere in there. And that's an Amherst College copy of an Amherst College map. This is the North Congregational Church in North Amherst. It was formed as the first church of Hadley, third precinct. Um, Jonathan's son, Jonathan, was the first baby baptized there. My dad was the last person memorialized there when it closed and became a Korean church. So we opened and we closed that church. And uh, Jonathan held a lot of offices and he bought the home farm. So now we're finally like at go. Like all that was just background. Now we're starting the store. So 1741, John bought the first parcels of timberland, one on Pulpit Hill, where I hope to live, and one, um, the home <coughs> farm, where we ended up building a house. So this is the deed of John selling his land in Hatfield and coming to Amherst. This, um, Jonathan had a son, not named Jonathan, the first no. one in America <laughs> to get interesting. So David built a home farmhouse. And it started out as a uh, salt box. Mm -hmm. And it had this back end. And it had a whole lot of barns attached to it. But um, I asked Uncle Denny what all this was. When he was a kid, this was the outhouse. And this was the kitchen. Because you didn't cook in the house because you burned it down. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> After the Revolutionary War, David's brother, so Jonathan's other son, Silas, fought on the side of the Brits, and we were on the side of the Patriots. I guess he liked Catholic and taxes. So he moved to South Amherst and put an E in his name because he didn't want to be confused with us. <laughs> and he wanted people to be able to pronounce his name. So that's Andrew Coles. And... Um, this is an account book of ours in the office from the 1700s. It was crazy what was in this office. Oh, but there's like, there's one of them? Yeah, this is all prayers. Like he's writing his bills and he's like, Oh Lord God, beseech shall you... I, it's, he was serious. This place was founded around the church for sure. Uh, 1786. More, more accounts. Crazy that we have this. When David died, these are his estate expenses. Um, they paid like one guy to build his casket. And his name was Ingram. Yeah. And coffin trimming. That was a dollar. Yeah. It, it's crazy amazing. So after we left Hatfield and settled at uh, the home farm where I still had my office, uh, we were located somewhere other than Amherst. Where where were we located? For a book. No? Belcher Town. No. Sarah got it. No. Sarah gets a book. <laughs> so Coles never changed location because it was still Hadley. And uh, yeah, so from 1727 to 1759, this was the third precinct of Hadley, and that's where what we lived in. And today, in 1768, I think it became Amherst. This is an early map of Amherst after it became a town. So now they start to have pictures and not just writing samples. So 
Uh, John Nichols continued to mar uh, manage the timber business. So he had the timber land from the first Jonathan Coles in 1741, and that's what built his house, David's house. And uh, this Jonathan uh, divided Shutesbury off from Amherst. We brought the sawmill to the woods because that was easier than bringing trees to a sawmill. Then after the wood was sawn, we brought the wood to the home farm, and that's where it was sold. Their son, Jonathan, was big into the church. <laughs> and he married Sarah Marsh Dickinson, and that's a relative of Emily Dickinson. And he ran the business out of the same home farmhouse that I run the same business out of today. And these are his property taxes from the early 1800s. Isn't that amazing? This, uh, he was the church collector. And the Amherst tax bill had uh, three lines. One was for the state, one was for the town, and one was for the church. That is amazing. Uh, yeah, look, we, we've been subscribing to the Gazette for 200 years. <laughs> I know, isn't that cool? And the Amherst record, too. We have receipts for that. And I uh, actually, I couldn't find the documentation, but I was trying to find out if we ever owned slaves, and I was just horrified to research it. And not only did I find no evidence of this, but we have subscribed to the abolitionist publication for a couple generations, too. So, thank goodness. We all were not like, unfortunate to Native Americans and not black people too, in our history. I mean, good heavens. Uh, Walter Dickinson Coles was the child of uh, the last Jonathan, and Egbert would have loved him. So this guy was born at the right time. He was born at the Revolu uh, Industrial Revolution, and he was somebody who could fully take care of that. He um, became the biggest <coughs> onion producer and lumber producer in the state of Massachusetts. He went to UMass and learned road building, and he had a company called uh, Coles and Childs, which built bridges and roads across the Northeast and in Amherst. He built the rock quarry at the Notch um, because he wanted to build a trolley system, and he had the timbers, but he didn't have the bedding, and he had to manufacture the bedding. Um, he was a state rep and a selectman. This is the longest timber bridge in the world after the 38 hurricane drew in the last one, and W.D. Coles helped build it in New Hampshire. This is Etta Uni of Shutesbury, and she married W.D. Coles. They helped build the North Amherst Library. Oh, is that a cool picture? Yeah. And that's Riverside Park on the right. And actually, Riverside Park began, and the name started, because they needed trolley ridership on weekends. And um, this was a destination like the Pelham Orient Springs that you could get on and pay your money and make the trolley viable seven days a week. Um, this is an early receipt with some early delivery trucks before our blue trucks at the store. Uh, another early truck. I can't, I don't know if anybody knows trucks, but this to me looks like it, it's scooted on a train track, mm -hmm. but because of the front wheels, but I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I know, look at the back. That's like, like, yeah. The front are the turning wheels. They are, but they look like they go on tracks. See this? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, so, Emily bought lumber from WD. This is Austin and his receipts. Uh, Henry Hills bought lumber from Walter. Uh, and there's one funny one which basically proves that people have been complaining about our building materials for 200 years. Uh, Henry Hills says, You delivered me another load of wet lumber, Walter. Stop it. Let me dry lumber next time. It's pretty funny from Henry Hills. Uh, this is Walter Dickinson. Um, he is in a number of pictures in his suit jacket and hat, pretending to actually work building his trolley line. Um, yeah, this is fun. 
this is like the eighth sister before, um, yeah, before WD's rock crusher took it down, and now the Holyoke Range has seven sisters probably, I'm joking, but I, I mean, where is that now? But this is the notch where Lane's rock quarry is. WD sold that to Lane. Uh, this is downtown, so this is the Bank of America. And this is WD Coles. And this is them building the trolley line right uptown with timbers and rocks. This is the same picture from a different angle. So you're looking down, where you just looked up, the town hall is now over here, and this is the common. Building the trolley line. This is my office, 134 Montague Road, the home farm, Hobart House, trolley tracks. And when that was redone, WD changed his house from a salt box to a colonial with an L, built a couple porches, but the front porch was a waiting station for the trolley. And it's nearly in the highway today. But I guess that was intentional because you want it right next to the tracks. So, Sarah, I think we found it the first bid. <laughs> I looked it up, the North Yarmouth Village Improvement Society, which you and I researched a long time ago, um, it was to make uh, North Amherst a more desirable place. They um, did things like building repairs, sidewalk, uh, shoveling, uh, public lawn mowing, bridge repair, but their biggest thing was they put oil in the street lights and made sure they were on from uh, sunset till sunrise. Pretty cool. First bit. Walter uh, was a slug man. This is uptown. I'm thinking. Somebody knows better than I do. Is this a North Amherst Common and we're looking toward UMass and this is the store? And this is like the House of Teriyaki now? I'm thinking that's this view. So um, Walter Dickinson Coles uh, with William H. Walker, my husband's great-grandfather, valued homes in the Coven together and Chuck's family lost their sawmill and grist mills because they were in the Swift River Valley, a uh, 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 valley over from us. But it was a it was a Western Mass effort to figure out how to flood that uh, Swift River Valley. This is um, the trolley coming out of the notch mm -hmm. and the Joe Larson Memorial Trolley Stop <laughs> at UMass. WD left all his passports in the house. <laughs> and they are stamped from everywhere. Wow. And this is a story about tarantulas and yeah. and trekking into the middle of the jungle and going to, and the, this isn't the Panama Canal story, but holy cow, the, the trips this guy took before yeah. it was really easy to do that. And uh, this was in the Boston Globe. The Boston Post is pretty amazing. Um, so they didn't name their kid Jonathan because it was a girl and Sarah Coles uh, was, I think she was cool because Uncle Denny says I remind him of her. <laughs> she was hard ass <laughs> and she got things done and I think she's cool. So she married Jerry Dennison Jones who was a Mass Aggie student from Nova Scotia and he ran the sauna. Cool. Wow. Yeah. She um, bred Dalmatians and peacocks and sheep and uh, all kinds of things, but her big thing was cows. She had a big dairy farm that was in my grand's antique barn and in the Atkins barn, and she had these giant cans of milk. There's one right back here with her husband's name on it. Uh, right back there, they would ship those south to um, Holyoke on the trolley. Well, it still ran. And they, uh, they said it had like whipped cream on the top layer, and I just can't even imagine shipping milk on the top and not having whipped cream on the top. This is Sarah in front of our barn. She had, um, I guess she had a locket, and on one side was Uncle Denny, and on the other side was a dog. And those were her favorite people. I don't know who was first, but she loved her animals. There's the milk bottle, and that's in the back. This is the reunion she went to of the Dickinson family in 1888, and that is some building in Amherst, I don't know where. 
This might be Sarah Coles. Walter's on the road. Is he? Sarah Coles. The little boy in the front. Oh. oh, really? Yeah, next to her? Cute. Uh, so this is Gerald. He was a state rep, and he ran the sawmill, and he um, did well at the timber company. <laughs> Who's Jerry Jones' name for? My cousin. Gerald. Gerald. Yeah! <laughs> Lots of them. Gerald. Okay. So, Sarah and Gerald helped start what's today the Fisher Home because Mrs. Fisher was a church constituent and she left her house and money and directions and they executed them. That house was not handicapped accessible for old people. So they ended up moving it, I think, to the end of Hobart Lane and it looks like this house, I'm guessing. And, uh, building a modern one by Tom Curley in the 60s, which my grandfather, Walter, helped do. And uh, we love them. They, uh, they're our favorite uh, longtime charity in North Amherst. That's Sarah in front of the home farm where I work today. This is her dairy business. So that is the Atkins barn. This is the manure shed, which we found evidence of when we built the parking lot at Atkins. <laughs> this is the antique bar that's falling in that we were rebuild, and these barns don't exist. And this is my office. Mm-hmm. All right, this is the front of her cow barn, which is now where you go get your Atkins stuff, like cider donuts. And this is the manure shoot, maybe stuff again. This is a view down to that, out of the top floor of the house mm-hmm. where my office is, the home farmhouse. So. Today the trolley barn is here, and I think this is the onion barn that's left, and these are gone now, and this is the Atkins area. So they had a son, named it for her father, uh, Walter. Egbert would have loved him too, because he did big things, and he was pretty amazing. Trivia! Where is this photo taken? Montague Road. Road. Looking for the church. Yes. And you're probably right over the river. This is the Ellen Story Beach. <laughs> you guys get to collect books. <laughs> I already own the book. Okay. <laughs> so this handsome dude is my grandfather. And he was amazing. Uh, Sarah Hartman, he says he met at church in Ohio, but I really don't know if that was true. She came to Mount Holyoke and they got married after she graduated and after she went to Faith Path Secretarial School to get useful and get a job because Mount Holyoke didn't do beans. Yeah. Uh, she worked for the editor of the Springfield newspaper as a clerk. Uh, he uh, is an inspiration to Evan and me because we have a workforce affordable housing dream for Amherst, and he was a founding member of the Housing Authority in Amherst, and he built a great example of workforce affordable housing that's market rate, uh, naturally affordable without subsidies. Uh, He built the first electric sawmill perhaps in the country, and he developed the Amherst Water Company, which is now your water supply. (laughs) It was a private business first. So when did it become easier to bring trees to a sawmill than sawmills to trees? Do we have a year or a, a, a reason? Tractors. Trucks, part of it. Yeah, so if you look at the Sanborn insurance maps of North Amherst at this time, there's a row of electricity in the middle of nowhere. And um, it was uh, for the sawmill here on Coles Road. Uh, Before that, there was an electrical house across the street for the trolley that in the trolley depot. So how do we have electricity starting in 1940 and a trolley before that? um, I didn't do enough research to tell you if anybody knows. Was the water power generator on Mill River? Uh, no, this was electric, but and bef- right. it was well, Eastman Brook where the, the yeah, now. I don't think there was a water generator, but it could have been, it must have been, huh, on Eastman Brook. 
I don't think there'd be enough water to regenerate electricity for the trolley. Not today. No river. Yeah. Or, but it would be, a, it was the depot is right, and the electric house was next to Eastman Brook, north of um, Coles Road. So that's a chestnut tree, cutting the hard way. Still had not invented the chainsaw. That was still rough. So this, I think, is the first example of workforce affordable housing market rate affordable. These are nice, small house lots with ranch and cakes on them. And they are going to be affordable forever. They were World War II, buy your first house when you're out of the war. And still today, a lot of first time, last time home buyers like it there. Um, I hope in my lifetime, Amherst will allow um, zoning by uh, the bedroom, not by the house. So if you have a two acre lot and you can build a four bedroom house on it, why can't you build four one bedroom houses on that same lot? And those will always be affordable. And uh, we will not have to have deed restrictions and donations from places to be able to have teachers and firefighters live where they work. So, I don't understand why policemen don't have balls anymore. <laughs> this is a bill from 1956 for the Policeman's Ball Program. Um, and uh, so I, I told you at the beginning that the reason why we stayed in business is because every generation kind of stopped the unaffected business of the past and it did what meant more to them, what made more sense for their generation. As soon as Sarah died, Walter auctioned all our cows and cut the timbers out of the Atkins barn and stored long units of lumber in it. And uh, when we converted it to Atkins, we had to go put posts back under the beams <laughs> because it had fallen in. Uh, somehow it stayed up all those years. Barns are amazing. That's Gramp. He built the North Amherst Post Office. Uh, he had a, a farm that ran from our home farmhouse to the um, Hadley border. 116 bisected that in his lifetime. He was a director of the fair, and he was um, one of the partners in Elder Jones Lumber, which is the same location as Leader is today, except it was turned around, and the, the head of the store was where the Lumberyard restaurant was, and that is why it was called the Lumberyard restaurant. So. Denny, uh, Walter and Sarah had three kids. My aunt and uncle, Denny and Gert, and my dad, Paul. And I could go way out with the branches of this family tree, but I am just going to focus on my dad to be an ab because we're close to a half hour, we have to be. <coughs> uh, so, he died, we emptied out his barn too. This is uh, Denny and Dad and Gert and their grandmother's cow on Coles Road. And Chico and Sheep and Denny and Dad. That is my dad. He married his high school sweetheart, Ruth Owen. <laughs> after graduation from UMass in the brand new Cape Cod Lounge of the Student Union, which is going to be done this year. She is um, a distant relative because she is from the South Amherst E. Coles family. Um, Dad did uh, manage the family timber and uh, real estate business out of the same home farmhouse that eight generations had before him. He built Riverside Park, which is on the Riverside Park trolley stop, but today it's a uh, 1970s strip mall and 48 apartments behind it. And it's uh, not known to you because there are no behavior problems there because they, they, uh, they have graduate students and adults living there and it's off the radar, but it's a beautiful place to live. And a couple of units are available if you're lucky. <laughs> Dad uh, built Cole's building supply in 1980 uh, because he wanted to provide the rest of the building materials people were asking for when they came to the sawmill. And when Aunt Gert came home in 1986, he uh, backed off, went back to the home farmhouse, ran that side of the business, and gave Gert his baby. 
Ed, she did a great job. Dad put a, a new planer and a timber sizer in. He built a dozen town roads with uh, Bob Patterson, his partner in Patterson Jones, at, um, Soccer Drive area, Cherry Lane Extension, Emily Lane, lots of those that houses uh, streets in that neighborhood. They built. That's Dad and the planer and Dad's sawmill and what the yard looked like. So this is the harp. <laughs> That's the new trolley barn there. That's Dad. That's my office today. I sit in the same place. This is his building supply store and his sawmill and planing mill and the, lo the lumber logs and lumber on Coles Road. That's an ad for everything he did in 1978. That is Bob Boone and he shipping uh, lumber to Ireland for caskets. Oh, and that yeah. little monkey is Evan. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell. Yeah. That little monkey is Evan. <laughs> That's me and Andy and Grant. And we grew up playing on foundations and in construction equipment, and we thought it was so cool. <laughs> and we still do, <laughs> and we pulled a sandbox to prove it. But um, it was so exciting to just understand the past of our family history and, and what came before us and what was possible in front of us. We grew up working in Dad's store. I had a mullet, and it was cute. Uh, we were told, don't even think about coming back till you get more useful, because you're not useful yet. So Evan uh, went over the top and got a degree in wood technology from UMass that's super useful, worked at another building supply company, uh, learned the ropes there before coming home to help Gert and Dad run the retail store. And I was working for nonprofit organizations in DC and Dad thought I was so good at nonprofits, I should come home to the family business because the lumber and land company was not making any profits. And they were, yeah, so it was perfect for me. So every kid in the family had to scrape and paint this four-sided white picket fence right here that is like the one at the North Hammer Cemetery. And the first order of business when I got home is I took out that wood fence and I put in these bushes. <laughs> no more, Evan's kids don't have the joy of learning the family business the same way. And they should thank me. So this is us, right when I came home. So um, we, we take our opportunity and responsibility very seriously. We didn't just start cutting trees and building solar farms and bulldozing sawmills. We thought about it. What do we have? What has been before us? What should be in front of us? What are all the things we have to work with? And what's the best thing we could possibly do with each one of them? So there are places where there's no broadband or cell service. Let's figure out what the highest peaks are. Uh, we have to pay for gravel to build roads. Maybe we have that on our own land. Goshen Stone. Boy, it's worth a lot if you could pay to take it out, which you can't, but that's an interesting thing to know where it is. There are amethysts on our, on our land. Amethyst Brook was named because they found purple things in it. Amazing. Um, we thought about what outlying open space should be protected and not ever uh, developed. And we worked, uh, Kristen DeVore of the Kessler Land Trust is our hero. She actually pointed this out and helped us do the right thing environmentally and we're really proud with our partnership uh, of our partnership with her. Uh, there are parcels that we identified on water and sewer near downtown Amherst, near downtown North Amherst that really should be contributing to the community that all the studies say Amherst needs. More workforce housing, a place for alumni to come back and retire relive the best years of their life and leave all their money to UMass because every dollar UMass gets 
Amherst benefits $16. Mm -hmm. So I, our goal, besides workforce affordable housing, is to get alumni who mostly live within two hours of Amherst to come back and retire here. Uh, we looked at wind power and solar power potential, failed with wind, succeeded with uh, solar. And we considered, we have a 30 acre parcel, half a mile north of UMass, and it loses money every year. Is this a good thing to do? Or should we maybe discontinue an outdated business that is thankless and do something that's more productive in this day and age? So after 10 years of fire, a rebuild, um, a lot of effort, instead of waiting till dad died to auction it off, we auctioned it while he watched. And uh, he was okay with uh, understanding that that business was in the past and that something else was in the future. And he, I think he saw it with us. And the benefit of having worked with my dad for 10 years in North Amherst in the home farm that we've been in since 1741 is he never left. I feel like I'm working with my dad every day still. He's just in the next room. And uh, it's a pretty amazing thing. So I know he's checking out what we have going forward. So like every generation before us, uh, while we manage the timberland, we are rebuilding the home farm to meet our generation's needs. So our ninth generation goals, okay, so the internet age, you can get everything online. Why do you need a downtown? <coughs> Well, would you get your date online, and what do you what do you do with her? <laughs> so text. Well, you take her and text together. Where are you going to do that? So I feel like malls took over downtowns, and now the malls are kind of dying, and now they're becoming amusement parks, and we're really missing personal connections. And there is an ideal downtown that I remember from living on Amity Street when I was a kid, and I want that back. So. Evan and I are building the Mill District, which is going to be the epicenter for commuters, for retirees, for young professionals to want to stay in town after they graduate. Um, and it's, it's going to be amazing because um, you can walk to Mill River Wreck and watch a baseball game or go swimming, walk on trails to Leverett from your door. You can walk to the post office, the library. We have a grocery store right out front, and we're opening a general store, Walter's General Store, uh, right below the new unit set of apartments opening in August. So restaurants, services, everything's going to be there, and I think um, you guys are going to like it. I think Egbert's going to like it. We also want to increase energy production. So we have a good start on the Mill District. We completed the largest private conservation project in Massachusetts history um, the year my dad died, and we named it for him. Uh, we are expanding our sustainable forest pr products with solar energy, and we're really proud of that. There's Sarah in this room, and um, this is uh, the dedication of the Paul C. Jones Working Forest. It's a the mountain range behind here, it's five and a half acres, five and a half square miles of um, managed forest that won't ever be developed because it's conserved. This is uh, Coles Road today. So this is the trolley barn, a make-believe version of, that everybody believes. All these newcomers are sitting in there, I have lunch with there. Hey, did you know this was a trolley? <laughs> so Sutherland had a, a 300th or something recently, and we built a plywood trolley for the for the uh, parade. And I asked the town if I could put it as a bus stop, and they said yes. So pretty soon we should probably build a metal one because a plywood parade float probably won't last forever. But it's so cool that there's a trolley next to the trolley bar. <laughs> and, and so we're trying to build this amazing downtown, that the ice cream window, Atkins, Sarah Coles, and Cow Barn. This is North Square. It op this building opens in July, and this one maybe October, November. Uh, 130 units of apartments owned by Beacon Community Development, who made all my dreams come true in two years and said 30, because we were going, a year and a half to build this, a couple million dollars. 
year and a half to build this, two million dollars debt that maybe Evan's kids will pay off someday. <laughs> and and Beacon said, we'll put $49 million into building a town square, 22,000 square feet of retail, which Moles will own and program as the ideal downtown. And we will build 130 units of people who will shop in your stores. Above <laughs> and uh, we will target seniors and young professionals. So like, all oh, bingo. So in one year, our ideal downtown is being built on the south side of Coles Road. And we are very excited. We were worried at first that uh, the Atkins would lose some customers because of the traffic. So our friend Hannah said, why don't we build a mini job site sandbox where kids can get all excited about construction. And we invited uh, the Jones Library to read sandbox story time once a week all last summer. And it was a huge hit. So kids are like, totally brainwashed with how cool construction <laughs> is. <laughs> and uh, um, first responders, there are four subjects that I approved for the library. So it's says first responders, diversity, uh, how cool farming is, and how cool construction is. So that's what the books are in this little free library if you take the kids. And there's a door so cats can't get in, but if they do get in, it's Peastone, so they don't like to poop in it. <laughs> the boxes are bad that way, and this is good. This is great. So there are construction trucks you can put on a hard hat, and there are plans for North Square. You can, you can build it with us, no matter how old you are. Right? <laughs> Jake's great food. So this is an aerial of the old home farm. That's Cole's building supply, trolley barn. What is to come? Town Square can be closed off so that all this is a flea market or art show. We're not just building buildings and leasing them out. We're trying to build community. Building community is the whole goal in this internet age. A place where experiences happen. Uh, so we had the library come and read books. This, these are kids enjoying these places. This is a, a soil scientist from Keith Construction explaining how cool it is to be a woman in construction to the kids who get free ice cream for listening to a story time in the library, uh, in the library's uh, sandbox. This is the opening of Atkins. We, we still, if anybody needs farm animal and fruit and vegetable costumes, we have so many, but we'll bring them out again. And uh, this was a lot of fun. And that's Swami with his rear on the steer. <laughs> but it's a, it's a cow, so that's not quite true. There are 19 farm animals, uh, like the couch there, that you can um, find if you go to Atkins. So this year, um, we're going to conserve 2,000 more acres. And these acres are going to protect Amherst water supply and the Quabbin uh, water supply. We're naming it after Grant. This is the history of our home farm. Ag, sawmill, new sawmill. Woo hoo! Yeah. This year. This is the history of our forestry. Still doing the same stuff, it's just easier. <laughs> same land, sustainably harvesting it for almost 300 years. So our plan is to continue to diversify the forest product production with solar farms Finding development partners for more parcels near North Square. We're going to increase the timber base and sustainably manage it. We will build market affordable housing in my lifetime in this town. And we are going to satisfy the needs of our community today without jeopardizing future generations' ability to satisfy their needs. We have been here. We respect the past. Any questions? <laughs> This was wonderful. Thank you. Have a lot of Sure, there, there's a um, John Gennadik uh, print of what the sawmill looked like a couple of years before it closed. It's on beautiful art paper and take one. Uh, there might be other things back there. I bet you could win a book if you said something cute to my mom and Sheila. <laughs> so the win is all this material that you had on the screen. 
wind up. It's a, not at the Jones Library, is it? They're newcomers. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a really good archive. I have fireproof safes that I'm organizing all this in. Uh, I've been told we should have a museum someday. Yeah. We've given some things to the Jones Library. We've given some things to the Historical Society. I don't think they can handle it. We have too much stuff. Yeah. yeah, so we'll figure it out. They'll get thumb drives for sure. What about the UMass Library? Their archives. They're even newer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We'll, we'll work on that. I know Mom's donated things to UMass Library, and that's a good idea. You mentioned the count books. How far back in time do they go, and what time span do they cover? 1700s to 1950. They go that so is, far that's back. no doubt a gold mine of local history. What, what are you going to do with this? Uh, I'm trying to archive them. I'm trying to figure out exactly what. Right now, I have Ziploc baggies full of receipts mm -hmm. from 1880, 1930, and 1950. Just bad useful. Yeah, um, UMass Special Collections would be very interested to help out with that. And they really need the attention of a professional conservator. It, it, that can be arranged. I'm, I'm open to it. It's, I would love it's to pretty look at amazing those myself but, once they become available. Oh, sure. It, the, the cool thing to me today, I was going through looking for more interesting tidbits to share. And there's a David Coles listed the value of his property when um, he died for his wife's inheritance. And so how much a couch is worth and how much a basket of food or something. It's a crazy detailed list of values in 1770. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. It is a good resource. I'll have to talk to my mom and see what she thinks because she's my advisor on everything in Storm. The registry probate. In Northampton, Mike, I don't know how far the deeds go back to the 18th century. I don't know if they have probates, but there might be a fair number of generations of estates there. You're just trying to make your deed research easier. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Sarah was the first woman who was kind of actively involved in the business, but she probably wasn't the face of the business just because of the times. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and she ran the um, farming side of the business, which is, well, her son ran the farming and the lumber side of it. He was an only child, too. Uh, she was a mom and ran the farm, and her husband ran the scary sawmill and the timberland all over the place. So that makes sense. That at the time, she was pretty powerful. So your generation is the first generation where you got to be a woman is kind of the face of... The lamp company. company. Yeah, no, and I was impressed because um, my mom raised my dad well. He was, he really, I was brought up to think that I could be a uh, mom, president of the United States at the same time, if that's what I wanted to do. And she convinced dad of that. And he felt confident in my ability to manage the timber and real estate part of the company after him. And I don't know that a lot of other dads in that generation would have done that. And I, I credit mom for uh, making the environment happen. <laughs>